Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're here at Zamperini Field in Torrance for a salute to North American Aviation. Well, it's great to meet you, Bob Hoover. You are the Grand Marshal for the event today. And what an event it is. Well, it certainly is. Uh, looking back on all those years of flying wonderful North American airplanes, and what a display we have here today. Well, I'll let you get on in. We're going to hear more about you in here. Well, thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, and I'm the director of the museum. I'd like to share with you the genesis of this event. Earl Theaker, a longtime North American aviation employee and retiree and museum volunteer, was looking at a dedication plaque on our F-86 to my father, Charles Maka, also a longtime North American aviation employee. And he decided it would be a wonderful idea to honor all of the people that built that great company. And he also wanted to pay tribute to Edgar Schmood, the design genius of the P-51 Mustang. Earl then corralled Lowell Ford, longtime North American aviation employee and a historian in his own right. And together, I'd like you all to thank them for providing the inspiration for this event today. Earl and Lowell, come forward. And now I'm going to turn the program over to Captain Jerry Stoll, United States Navy, retired. Great honor for me to be here today as Master of Ceremonies for the Salute to North American Aviation. We've got an exciting program for you today. Some VIPs from North American Aviation are here, several P-51 Aces, and of course, Mr. Bob Hoover. We are honored to have with us from Torrance City Council, Council Member Bill Sutherland. First of all, on behalf of Mayor Frank Scotto and the entire city council, we would like to thank Mr. Hoover for what he's done. But as I look out in the audience, I see many people out there that fought, fought in World War II, and because you're you, we are here, and we want to thank you also. <laughs> and was, one last thank you, and that is to the uh, West Museum of Flight. Without you being here in Torrance, this event would not take place. So please, people, support the museum so these events can take place every year, and we can thank people every year because, because of you, we have the privileges of doing what we want, when we want, and how we want to do it. Thank you. There are also some folks at the front table who we should acknowledge. Uh, some aces. Mr. James Brooks, Robert J. Goble. Commander Willis Hardy, Bob Gilliland, the guy who flew the SR-71. Mr. Gulcher joined North American Aviation in 1951. He was designer B to the Chief Engineer, Columbus Aircraft Division. Worked on numerous aircraft programs, including the AJ-2P, the F-86E, FJ-2, 3 and 4, F-100H, A-5A, T-2 A and C, RA-5C, T-28, OB-10, X, F, V, one, two. I feel like I'm doing an eye chart. <laughs> he transferred to Los Angeles in 1979, Vice President of Research and Engineering Aircraft Operations Programs. Sabreliner 65A, HIMAT B1B, Vice President of Advanced Programs, 1996, Programs X31, AC-130 Gunship, X30, and he retired in October 1991. And he consulted from 1992 to 2004 with Rockwell, Boeing, and Advanced Systems Research. Well, it's nice to be here. Nice to see everybody. What a great salute to North American Aviation. How many of you actually work for North American Aviation? Put your hands up. Wow, look at that. That is just terrific. Now, how many actually flew North American airplanes? Yay, terrific. OK, where did it all start? Started in 1934, actually. Uh, there's history prior to that, which you can find 
Uh, if you Google it or, or talk to Ed or somebody, they'll tell you about it. But I'm going to start in 1934. This is when General Motors decided that uh, Dutch Kindleberger would be president of what then was becoming the North American Aviation. And then he brought along Lee Atwood, who was a chief engineer. Both of them had worked at uh, Douglas in Santa Monica, so he decided it was pretty nice in California. They had just gotten a trainer contract from the Air Force, so they decided to move to California to what was called Mines Field. Not sure what that was. Mines Field, which became then eventually LAX, but that was the corner there of, of uh, Imperial and, and uh, uh, Aviation. So anyway, that was a start. They had 75 people and no products. So they decided that they would, uh, military things were probably good. When you think about that was 1936, uh, things are happening in Europe and all around and, and pretty scary stuff and he thought, both of them thought, both of them by the way were outstanding what I would call strategic planners, although they probably didn't consider themselves that as we would today. But anyway, they decided that the military airplanes was really probably the thing to be in. So that's what they started, and boy, did that come up happen. So they decided to do that, and the first was a B-25, and that was designed by Lee, Lee Atwood, and Ray Rice. Maybe some of you remember Ray. He was. So that was B-25. The next one was a P-51. That was Ed Schmood, and also Ray Rice. And by the way, Ed Schmood, you know, kind of left and then went to that other place called Northrop. After a while, there were quite a few actually that went from, the, from North American to Northrop. In fact, it was the point where they were starting to call it South America. <laughs> so anyway, and then also they had the T-6, which was a continuation of, of many trainer airplanes that, uh, of course, North American Aviation was part of. During World War II, they built 15,500 P-51s. They built almost 10,000 B-25s and 15,000 T-6s or the Texans. That was in three locations. That was in Kansas City, Dallas, Texas, and here in Inglewood. That's over 40,000 airplanes. They referred to Dutch Kindleberger as the Henry Ford of the airplane because he, he built sections of airplanes, stuffed them, and then assembled them together, which had never been done before. And that's what really allowed so many airplanes to be built. In fact, they were turning out airplanes one every 15 minutes from those three locations. So that's where it all started. And what a, what a fantastic start because it became, as you know, the P-51 superior fighter over Europe and others. The uh, B-25, of course, was a bomber over Europe. And the trainer, probably we trained many of you as, uh, as you went into the Air Force or the Navy. So anyway, what happened after 940, uh, 1945? Uh, we saw a number of these Navions out here. They really looked beautiful. They built 1,100 of those. And this was to keep the staff together and all, but they thought commercial airplanes ought to be a really good thing. All of these pilots are going to come back and they're going to want to have an airplane. Of course, they probably kept back and they couldn't afford one anyway. But anyway, they, they sold actually a little over 800. I think it was 860. And uh, Dutch was asked one time, could I buy a Navion for cost? And he said, I'll sell them all to you for cost. Because <laughs> they didn't make any money on any of them. The next one was the T-39. We already mentioned about Gene Salve. And uh, of course, it turned into the Sabre liner. But that also was one of those in between, between that and the next war, which was a Korean War, but prior to that, they had developed a, a fighter. They started uh, with a straight wing fighter, but they, they spent some time over in Germany understanding what the, the swept wings were all about. So they turned it into a swept wing airplane, and it's what you see out here today. Just an absolutely fantastic airplane, and it was certainly excelled in, in, any, in on all of the various things in Korea. In fact, they say it's what kept China from coming into the war. So anyway, this brings me to Columbus, which is where I started, which the captain mentioned. Columbus was uh, decided by Dutch Kindleberg. He did not want to 
have a second source for the F-86. He wanted to keep that to himself. So he went to Columbus, the old Curtis Wright plant, and started that, and always referred to it as the Columbus Experiment, because he never thought it was necessary to have divisions. Well, the Columbus Experiment did very well, because they took people from LA, probably a lot of them that you know, and they staffed Columbus with, that, with them. This was people like Reuben Berkey, uh, Paul McCormick, George Gherkins, Mac Blair, by the way, who's probably one of the better aerodynamicists of the time. And we built a lot of aircraft. Uh, it was already mentioned by some of you, but anyway, there F-86s, T-6, F-100s, T-28s, the AJs, the AJ-2, FJs, and then the FJ-3 and 4. And then fortunately, at that time, Frank Compton came. Frank Compton, as we already meant, did you write that, what they said about you? No, okay, that's what I figured. <laughs> Frank and I go way back. He, of course, was a head of advanced design in Columbus. And uh, 1953, I believe, 1954, thereabouts, he came up with, with a team to develop the vigilante airplane. And it was called then the NAGPAW. You remember that, Frank? And uh, eventually became the A3J, and then was the A5A, and also called a vigilante. It was a supersonic twin-engine airplane for nu carry nuclear weapons and was carrier-based. It was quite a, quite a chore, it was a, but it ended up being just an absolutely sleek, wonderful airplane. Ma made many uh, records and all of that. Now, that wasn't enough for Frank. He went after the trainer, the T2 trainer, and uh, won that contract. So here was two major contracts, one of them a weapon system, which was the A5, and the other one, the, the primary trainer for the Navy, won both of them. And my hat has always been off to Frank. Fortunately, I was able to work with him. He and I kind of traveled together and did a lot of things together. And it was really an honor to be able to work with a guy like Frank. Then we went on to the RA-5C. We took, uh, the Navy decided they were not into the PSYOP all that much in the med, so they wanted to change the airplanes into a reconnaissance airplane. And what we did, we developed uh, the RA-5C, which was a multi-sensor, uh, aircraft that uh, had, uh, yes, cam cameras, but had side-looking radar, IR, passive ECM, all of that, and plus uh, data processing center on all the carriers. So that's what, uh, in fact, that was what I spent a lot of my life on. And then also the OV-10, and these, I think this was typical of North American aviation. They responded to World War II, they responded to the Korean War, and the OV-10 and the RA-5C responded to the Vietnam War, so it was typical of that. Meantime, out here, a lot of things were going on, but there were more of the, the uh, uh, technology kind of things. Of course, they, they continued to build F-100s. They built uh, the X-15, which a lot of astronauts have flown. Uh, Charlie Feltz, by the way, was the chief engineer on it. He was just a terrific guy. The XB-70, the 107, 108. And again, these were people like Harrison Storm, Stormy, as we referred to him, and Ralph Rood, if you remember. Uh, okay, so what was Dutch and Lee's vision at that time? He had an experiment in Columbus for a division, decided they really wanted to have more divisions, but they were looking forward, out in the future, to space and to uh, rockets and to electronics and things of that sort. So they started divisions, the space division, which, by the way, Dale Myers here was uh, very uh, instrumental in all. In fact, he was the uh, program manager on the shuttle. Hal Raiklin, did he leave? Hal Raiklin was the uh, program manager on the uh, second stage of the Saturn, and then went on to B1A and other things. And then there was uh, Rocketdyne, Dick Schwartz, and other, other people. In fact, Sam Acabellis came out of there. There was uh, Autonetics, uh, if you remember John Moore, uh, Fred Eystone, they, they, they won basically the Minuteman inertial system then. And I should mention that on the A5, we went to Autonetics to develop what was called the ASP-12. And it was Frank who, and I both, we went to the aerophysics lab, found Wilbur Mitchell, who by the way came back and developed that system, and it was just an outstanding system the way it worked. Okay, then there was, uh, going through all of this in the early 60s, there was a program called AMSA, AMSA, I don't remember what it said, but we always called it America's most studied airplane. You probably remember that, but anyway. But it turned into the B-1, the B-1A, and that was in the uh, early 70s. 
and they had a go-ahead in 76 and for 244 airplanes, and of course, Jimmy Carter canceled it in 1977. Now with a foresight of, I'll say, Buzz Hello, he hung on to some things. He hung on to the tooling, he hung on to 1,200 and some engineers, he hung on to the, the prototype airplane to develop the uh, pulse Doppler uh, countermeasures, all of these things, and there are many more, were the kind of things that would help get the B-1 started again. And, and by gosh, he did. He was very instrumental with the kitchen cabinet of uh, Ronald Reagan's. And we started then the B-1B in 1982 with the contract. I'm sorry John Piero is not here. He was one of the program managers, although the early one was uh, Bu uh, Buzz Hello, and then uh, uh, Ike Bellis was next, and then when uh, Buzz went to uh, Washington, uh, John Piero took over the program management, and, and Sam was the uh, head of the division, the operations. By the way, through all of that, Lee would review, help us. There was always a review team for the B-1, and uh, this would be in the boardroom, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. Lee would be kind of quiet. You know, Lee was the kind of a, uh, uh, more of a, I call him, a, we'd call him a geek today. He was the technical guy, where uh, Kindleberger was more the outgoing, the salesman, and all of that. So uh, Lee would always come to these meetings, he'd be very quiet. But after the meetings, why, he'd usually uh, get me and he says, now, what about, he'd always have some technical detail on the airplane that he would remembered before, and he wanted to know more about that, so I'd tell him, you know, and all that. So he stayed very active, and mentally he was just terrific. So all of these came from Dutch Kindleberger and Lee Atwood. That all started in 1934, can you imagine? Dutch, of course, left us all in 1962. But Lee saw it all. He saw it all go through and all of that. So today, it's a salute to North American aviation, but it's also a tribute to Dutch Kindleberger and Lee Atwood. Thank you. So Mr. Hoover, I think the only way that I could sufficiently and humbly welcome you and introduce you to this great crowd would be to say that on behalf of everybody who's here today, I thank you, sir, for everything you did for this country, for the aerospace industry, for your character, for your friendship. You've touched many, many lives. I'm sure there's a lot of pilots who come up to you to this very day and say, Bob Hoover, because of you, I do what I do and I fly. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bob Hoover. I would like to say thank you for all of you turning out here. This uh, airport is uh, sort of like home to me. I first started flying my airplanes out of here in 1950. And up until just a short time ago when I had to retire from flying uh, for health reasons, uh, this, this has all changed. All of these hangars, and it's, it's, it's like going away for 30 years to see what's happened since I quit flying here. But I'd like to tell you I'm humbled by seeing all of these friends who I admired and respected that worked for North American Aviation. They're, they're, they've done so much, so many accomplishments, and you've heard of most of them here today. But to be associated with these fine people uh, has been the treasure of my life uh, more than anything else. I look over here at my ace friends, and I'd like to tell you that the epitome of being a fighter pilot is to become an ace. And I have respected and admired each and every of the, one of the many aces that there have been in our great country. I never quite got there, but believe me, I tried as best I could. <laughs> I'm uh, pretty crippled up now. I had to bail out of a, an F-84 when I was on the X-1 program with Chuck Yeager. And uh, he and I had addition, additional responsibilities uh, other than the X-1 program. When it wasn't scheduled for flight, we would test whatever the, it was on, the operations people wanted us to fly. And I was testing a new 84 uh, that had a, a, a different engine in it and uh, this was 
oh, right after Chuck had, had gone faster than sound, and I was next to go, and I went into the operations, and there was my name on the board to test this airplane, and I was up over the Mojave Desert at about 40,000 plus feet, and I got fire warning light on, shut the engine down, and the engine seized. Now, normally that would throw the turbine wheel right through the fuselage and cut the tail off. But in my case, it didn't. It was an airplane that had the first ejection seat that we had in the United States. We copied it from the German airplane, and I'm going to show you a film in a minute here that you have, you'll be able to see this airplane. It was a Heinkel 162, had a jet engine mounted on the top of the fuselage, and they designed the ejection seat for it in order to get your above the intake of the engine so you wouldn't get sucked into the engine. And uh, the ejection seats in those days uh, had such a powerful charge, if you weren't frozen in the position uh, that you had to be, uh, you were sure to get your neck broken or your back. And uh, I was scared to move once I uh, knew I, what I had to do. I had to get out because I'd lost all my controls. So, the control rods had burned through, but the tail was still on the airplane. And so it just started pitching over, and I was scared to move. Finally, I decided I've got to, and I reached up and grabbed that canopy handle, and I went with the canopy and hit the tail, broke both legs through the back of the knees, and boogered up my face from my, my face hit the knees, and fortunately I had my oxygen mask on, and the helmet was still with me at that point. But let's look at that film, if you, whoever's operating the projection. Introducing a legendary test pilot. Today, America's premier air show performer, Mr. Robert A. Bob Hoover. Bob has thrilled audiences all over the world with his stunning performances in the Shrike Commander and the Saberliner business jet. He's a big show-stopping attraction for all ages, especially children. Bob's aviation career started during World War II, where he served with the 52nd Fighter Group. He was shot down over the Mediterranean while single-handedly dogfighting with five German fighters. He was held prisoner till war's end. In 1946, Bob was assigned to Wright-Patterson to test and evaluate captured World War II aircraft. Later, he was selected for the X-1 program, where he became lifelong friends with Chuck Yeager. In 1950, he became a test pilot for North American Aviation, test flying F-86s, and first flighting the Navy FXJ-2 and the T-28. He traveled the world demonstrating jet aircraft performance capabilities for our troops. Korea, the Philippines, where there were jets to fly, Bob Hoover was there. He's performed in numerous international air shows and today puts on both foreign and domestic air shows at over 35 geographic locations. He's been awarded the highest military honors, together with over 100 of the world's most prestigious aviation awards. In 1988, Bob Hoover was inducted into the Aviation Hall of Fame. Sit back now and enjoy flying excerpts of the man who is known today as a living aviation legend. The one, the only, Robert A. Bob Hoover, flying the Saberliner business jet and the Shrike Commander.
Robert A. Bob Hoover. A magical, all-American name that packs the house at air shows all across America. Truly one of the most popular and respected names in American aviation. So a lot of people don't really know what uh, we test pilots have had to go through. Sometimes it looks like it's a pretty straightforward thing, uh, but hours and hours of boredom in many cases with stark terror every now and then squeezed into the program. When I had to run these tests on the spin for the F-100, I did it by the textbook. Uh, we we uh, uh, just going up and doing a stall is not acceptable in proving the airplane to the government according to the contractual arrangements and agreements on uh, the design of the airplane. And uh, the first spins that we did with it, we just stalled it like you would any other airplane. It would recover from the spin very comfortably. However, if you crossed your controls, and we had to do that to prove that the airplane could be recovered no matter what you did with it, and you're thinking in terms of a second lieutenant right out of cadet training, and uh, the textbook, the handbook uh, for the specifications require that you decrease your airspeed one knot per second. And when you get it there, then you cross controls, and that's the worst thing in the world you could do. And so the airplane, instead of having the nose drop through when you tried for the recovery, the nose pitched down and up and down and up. And uh, I had a drag chute, you saw that extended. It was uh, useless, it was just floating up uh, straight up. I had a, uh, a planned test card that I'd written up and I had to change the control application every four turns in an effort to find some way to get it out. And the first thing I did, of course, when I wanted to recover was hit the afterburner, but it would not ignite. I was backing up. In a flat spin, you're turning about an axis, gyroscopic axis, that is about 500 feet in front of the airplane. So you're backing up for all practical purposes. Well, when the afterburner didn't take, and I later did uh, recover from uh, flat spins with the afterburner, so if, if that hair works, it, it saved a lot of pilots. But the drag chute didn't work, of course. Uh, and so every four turns, I would change the control application, calmly say to the control people, the engineers in the control tower, I was going to the next set of control applications. And when it was all over, uh, I said, I listened to the tape and I thought, I sounded calm. I wasn't calm, I was absolutely terrified. <laughs> <laughs> but when I got out of the airplane at minimum altitude, I looked up and I, here's the airplane coming right at me, only it was spinning around me. And of course it went past, right past me real quick. And I was floating down, I had the parachute open, everything was good. And uh, I went, went out on the ejection seat which is the easy way to go. And uh, I was looking at the ground, watching the airplane spinning, and I kept saying to myself, don't stop now. <laughs> well, it obviously didn't. But I can tell you that a lot of times the weight distribution will break the gyroscopic effect. And uh, I know that the, like Donald Douglas uh, people called our company and asked if they could consult with me about flat spins. I'd done a lot of spins at a lot of other airplanes. And uh, they, were, they were doing their tests for their specification requirements on the 101 Voodoo. And I briefed the test pilot on what I'd experienced and suggested that he give himself a little breathing room and uh, be sure that uh, he, he did everything right. But uh, he, it, the airplane was completely uncontrollable. And I saw all the footage on the, the Voodoo uh, the spin test. And believe it or not, the weight distribution of him leaving the airplane and the canopy being gone broke the gyroscopic effect. 
And as a result, the airplane recovered by itself and he's floating down in a parachute and it, it bellied in on the desert floor there at Beer Rock. And uh, it just gives you some idea. There's a lot of quirks about spins. You, you could do them for years and, and sometimes they, they just don't want to come out. I remember I'd flown that commander for 25 years and I'd done five turn spins at every exhibition I'd participated in and never had a problem. It always come right out. Well, this one day in Fort Worth, it just went flat on me, just like the F-100. And I took the throttles off and I slammed one throttle forward and that wouldn't stop the rotation. Normally it would. I, I, I did spin tests on the P-38 and uh, that just used to be standard practice to put it in a flat spin and then recover with the other engine and the, the good one off and the other one on to stop the rotation. Well, that didn't work with the strike. But what you're going, like I mentioned, you're going backwards and your elevators, if they're up, it takes all the force you've got, if you don't have uh, irreversible controls, to push that yoke forward and hold it there. So I did this, I stiff-armed it with my left hand and took the, both throttles, had both throttles off and I slammed them together and I got that elevator so that it was in the power at the same time and it came out. But boy, I'll tell you, I, I never did another spin in that airplane. And that's the same reason I quit with the Mustang. We used to think we had some consistency there on spin recovery, but that's not true. One airplane will, will spin differently than another. And uh, I've been very concerned on a number of flights where I was flying somebody else's airplane and it wasn't uh, rigged uh, as it should have been. And it, the airplane was very difficult to recover from. But uh, I've had a great life because of all the many people I've met and the folks I've respected. And my time with North American and Rockwell will always be remembered as the best, the very best. Thank you. The question is, what was the altitude uh, that you started for your flat spin when you ejected? Uh, 42,000. And the, the elevation up in the desert is about, I think, 2,300 feet. You know, one interesting aspect of uh, doing specification flying we had the F-86 uh, go through a, a lot of growing pains in its early days, and we had, we had uh, spin accidents, and there were quite a number of them, and the pilots in most cases were lost, but I had done spins in the F-86 hundreds and hundreds of times, uh, demonstrating it all over the world to different countries that bought it, and uh, I gotta tell you, it, it was just as honest as anything you've ever seen. However, I was, I was uh, demonstrating it to the Air National Guard from three or four states up in Boise, Idaho. And uh, the maneuver I'd started with, I'd do a, a double Emmerman, which was uh, sort of difficult to do because you get so slow over the top. And uh, then I'd kick it into a spin uh, at the top of the double Emmerman. That'd be 5,000 feet above the ground. And I would, uh, I would be pulling out at about 5,000, excuse me, I'd be higher than that to, to make the pull out. But as soon as I booted the rudder for the spin, boy, the airplane wrapped up on me like going straight down, just spinning like this. And I thought, what in the world is going on? I looked out and I saw one slat was racked, which means that it was opened at the, at the root and closed at the, at the, out on the end of the wing. And it was stuck in that rotation because just going like this. And we had a lot of accidents where the pilots did survive and they said they couldn't stop it from, from spiraling. And so I, I, I uh, just powered it out. I put, went to full fall throttle on the engine and sure enough, I was able to get it out. And I got in on the base operations and I called up Smokey Caldero, who was a two-star general in flight safety over at Norton Air Force Base. And he had uh, 
been to North America and visited with us a lot about all these spin accidents. And I had done the spins and with all kinds of unusual uh, loadings where you'd think you'd never get out where you're asymmetrically loaded up with tanks and bombs on one wing and the other one clean. You could get it out every time. Well, I, I called Smokey and I said, Smokey, I just found out what's wrong, what caused all those accidents. Please do me a favor and clear the records for pilot error. And the great company I worked for, North American Aviation, listened to me and they put side rollers on those slats so that it would be impossible to have the slats wrapped like that. And a little side story, I flew out in the Southeast Asian countries at the CEDAW conferences. I'd go out each year to fly a different country's airplane. And I was going to the Philippines this one year, and our tech rep told me, called me up, and he said, they're building that airplane from scratch. They were, the, the people over in Southeast Asia don't like to lose face if you have a problem with one of their airplanes. And so they said, boy, I t he said it's shined up, and they've just gone through it. And I showed up, and I was in my business suit, and I walked over, and I ran my slat check, which is to pull the slats out, and then have somebody hold it in at the, at the end, and then see if it would come out by itself. And uh, it didn't. And so I asked the, the Filipino uh, crew chief, I said, is that airplane service right next to it? And he said, yes. And I said, let me check its slats. And I did, and they were OK. And so I took off and flew the show. And I came back, and Al Moorman was a three-star general there at Clark Air Force Base. And he said, I was sitting next to the commanding general of the forces in the Philippines. And when he saw you swap airplanes, he said he turned pale. <laughs> I had no trouble with it. It flew like a dream. But we then redesigned those slats to where we had uh, a different leading edge on the wing. And uh, uh, those slats had side rollers as well. So it all worked out in the end. Mr. Hurd, one second. I have a question uh, for you, sir. In your book, I read that uh, Yuri Gagarin kind of saved you from the KGB in Moscow. So as an intelligence officer, I was wondering if you'd say a few words about when you flew a Soviet aircraft in Moscow and, and what happened to you. Okay, I hate, I hate to keep people waiting so long here. But uh, I had performed, in 1965, I was over at the Paris Air Show. And uh, President Johnson had stated that we would not have any participation in the Paris Air Show and uh, any U.S. participation. But we could have booths, but no flying displays. And I was over there for North American Aviation uh, just to snoop around and find out what I could that the other companies were doing. And Chet Bolin was the uh, ambassador to France. And the second day of the show, he came out to wanted, he called and said he'd like to come out and visit with me. And this was the first time the Russians had ever come back out from behind the, the, the bar barrier, if you will. And they brought their, the, the uh, capsule that uh, Bulgarian went up in, and the Vokstad. And then he brought, they had the one there where they, they were the first to get three people in space at the same time. And they had uh, Gagarin there, of course, and uh, a lot of the top people. And they had the, their number one test pilot in Russia. He was a general and uh, very polished and spoke great English. Well, for some reason, the FAA got, I mean, the, our Air Force got the idea, the CIA, CIA did, that I had gotten pretty well acquainted with this general, and he had, had told me that he was flying the E-266, and it was a Mach 2 airplane. And at that time, we didn't have anything that good, and it turned out it would, later on became the MiG-21. But they were absolutely, I, I believe me, can you imagine letting somebody from another country 
fly one of your secret airplanes. And they thought in 1966, when I was selected to be the U.S. team captain for the international aerobatic competitions, uh, why would they let me fly that airplane? Be ridiculous. But they insisted, and I spent some time uh, on Lang at Langley uh, being shown what, could I could what I could anticipate would happen to me. And uh, I was assured that uh, the ambassador would have me out and, and I wouldn't get under arrest if I flew one of the Russian airplanes. Well, they didn't let me fly anything but the airplane that they had won the competition with, which was a Yak-18. And it was built for no other purpose except to win the competition. And we had home-built airplanes. That was the best we had in this country at the time. And uh, when they won the, the competition, 17 countries involved, uh, they let me fly the, one of the winning airplanes that uh, their team captain had uh, been flying. And it had it serviced. And, and a million people on a Ticino airport and no traffic jams and a, a very polite applause when they won the, the, the competition. But I got in the airplane and instead of taxiing out to the runway, I just took off from right where I started the engine and went straight for a dike that went all the way around 180 degrees of the Ticino Shoal airfield. And uh, I lifted it off the ground. I've been watching it fly for 11 straight days, several times a day. And I knew how long it could fly upside down on the fuel they had. And uh, I knew everything about it because it was pneumatic, uh, Spitfires and Hurricanes. Most of the British airplanes had uh, pneumatics. Air pressure would, would take care of the landing gear, the flaps, and uh, even if our engine start. And so I've been watching this closely for 11 days. So I held it down and stayed on the ground till I read plenty of airspeed. And I had enough airspeed to pull up and I retracted the gear as soon as I lifted off. But I had enough speed to roll upside down and make it look I was like I was going to go right into the dike. And so instead of getting up, I got up to the dike and I just pushed the nose up and went out of sight on the other side of the dike. Now everybody thinks, well, what's happened? He's lost the airplane. And I rolled right side up as soon as I got on the other side of the dike. And I flew all the way around 180 degrees out of sight. because I was below the level where they could see. And uh, I rolled it upside down now, over the dike and crossed. And I did everything that they had done to win, only I did it inverted. <laughs> Well, it was a great moment for, for a little while, and that was all, because when I landed, you hear these people who are stoic and never showing any emotion, they all, they had no crowd control, and boy, they just came right out to where I'd parked the airplane, and uh, I thought they were going to destroy the airplane, and I, and I thought, boy, they're going to wreck this airplane, and I'm going to get credit for it. I know I didn't over G it or anything, and so finally, they beat a path up to me, a bunch of soldiers, it was their rifles, and an interpreter was following right along behind them, and he, I couldn't get out of the cockpit. The airplane was rocking so bad, I'd try to stand up, and I, it was just really going up and down. And, and I asked the interpreter, he, uh, I said, where are you taking me? Because I had a gun on me, a rifle. And uh, he said, I'm not permitted to tell you, but you're under arrest. Well. They, they took me back to the hotel, and uh, they had little cameras about the size of your thumbnail, and they had them placed all over the bathroom. So they were looking at you when you were in the shower, and I was briefed about all these things by CIA at, at Langley, and they said they're going to be taking millions of pictures of you wherever you go, and they were certainly true about that. And what they were trying to do was take enough pictures to where they make, could make you look like you were a homosexual with a, a, another man and then blackmail you. And so they, they advised me I could expect that. Well, 
I didn't have any problem with that, but I didn't like somebody looking at me every time I went to the bathroom. <laughs> well, I, they just, I went ahead and showered, and this was the big ceremony, the banquet at night, and so the, these guards, they had two guards posted on the door, so I couldn't go out of the room. And uh, the interpreter showed up and knocked on the door and told me who he was, and he came in and he said, uh, uh, we're taking you away. And I said, where are you taking me to? And I said, can I contact the embassy? No, I can't tell you anything. I can't tell you where I'm taking you. Well, in this hotel, the big auditorium had curtains that came down on each side and, and each end, and the curtains were up. And Gagarin was on a microphone talking in Russian. And he looked up and saw me, and we'd gotten pretty well acquainted at the Paris Air Show the year before. And uh, he yelled for the guards to bring me into the platform there. And they did, and uh, Garen went on and on. I didn't know what he was saying. I learned later it was a, a lot of complimentary things. But uh, the head of, of what I guess would be their FAA said, uh, I was we were, he said, you've broken every rule we ever have because, have ever had because you're not supposed to fly any kind of an aerobatic maneuver below 300 feet that you were right on the ground. And uh, he said, however, we don't think you could survive two such flights, so we're going to release you, and we're sure you'll never do it again because nobody could survive that twice. <laughs> I'm here with Bob Goble, and he says he's just a farm boy from Wisconsin, but I'm sure there's a lot more that you'd like to share with us. Well, there is, of course. Uh, uh, I was a very young man when Pearl Harbor occurred, and, uh, and so I joined the Air Force and graduated in May of 1943. Uh, after that, I went over to Europe and flew uh, combat, in, uh, first in Spitfires and then in P-51s. Uh, the... Uh, standard by which every by which fighter pilots are judged is is uh, to become an ace. They fi have have five victories in the air. You uh, had a lot more than that. I did indeed. I had eleven, uh, 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 which which uh, uh, counted me quite fortunate, I, I suppose. Uh, but uh, as you gain experience and and knowledge and and uh, and. Uh, uh, the ability to shoot, uh, uh, it gets a little easier as, as, as time goes on. So I completed 61 missions. Uh, I was still only 21 years old when I returned back from uh, back from the European theater. So uh, uh, we learned in a very big hurry what uh, what uh, what this was all about in the fighting a war. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your service to our country. Well, it, it, I'd like to say it was a pleasure. It wasn't a pleasure, but but uh, it was something we had to do, and, and we all picked in and, and, and did our bit. And thank you for being here at the event today. Thank you, thank you. I'm here with Bill Hardy, and he's an ace and a day. What does that mean, Bill? Okay, an ace is any fighter pilot who shot down Five or more enemy airplanes in one, at, at five or more enemy airplanes. An ace is a day is anybody who did it in a day. And uh, I, if you want to hear more about that, I can yes. tell you. Yes. What What did you fly? I flew the F6F Hellcat off the USS Hornet wow. CV-12 at that that particular day when I got the five or particular evening when I got the five, I was flying an F6F Hellcat, and uh, that was April 6th, 1945, wow. the day the Japanese sent down every kamikaze they could round up, every airplane, every pilot, and sent them down that one day, and uh, we fighter pilots from the Fifth Fleet shot down 300 and some that day. I shot down five, my wingman shot down three, 
uh, our little squadron on the Hornet, which is VF-17 Jolly Rogers, shot down 48 that day. And so it was kind of a bad day for the kamikazes. They ended up uh, getting buck fever and attacking the picket destroyers north of Okinawa instead of going on in to try to get the big sh end of the fleet and get the bigger ships. And, uh, and so they sunk one destroyer that night, disabled a couple more out of about 14 destroyers that were flying radar pickets uh, to intercept them before they got to the fleet or to the battle ground on Okinawa. Well, thank you for your service. Well, you're entirely welcome. It was fun, and, and I thought, being an old farm boy, that it was nice to be getting paid to fly, which I love to do. I'm here with Bob Gilliland. You're one of the honorees today, too, Bob, and this is quite an event here. Indeed, it is quite an event, and I want to thank Cindy Maka for setting it up, and uh, all of us uh, were fans of North American aviation, and I would like to comment right now that it irks me greatly that that name North American Aviation is now virtually vanished because it's, they've hired, uh, it's out of business and Boeing is the one that bought the remnants of the company but they did all of those great things under that name and it's virtually disappeared. I call that historical revisionism. And you were a good friend of Bob Hoover's. Hoover indeed and I are good friends from way way back and we're both from Tennessee. He's from Nashville and I'm from Memphis and he's a great great pilot. I don't agree with everything Chuck Yeager says, but one thing I do agree with when he said he's the greatest stick and rudder man that ever lived. What did you fly? Well, I flew a bunch of them because I was a, uh, I was former Navy and then I was former Air Force and as a test pilot for the military down in Florida at Eglin Air Force Base and then a test pilot out here at Edwards uh, and Palmdale and secret places for Lockheed. And so the most prominent thing that I'm well known for is uh, the SR-71, like on this hat. And that's the fastest airplane ever built anywhere on planet Earth, and still is. Would you like to tell a little story about Bob Hoover? Something that happened? Let's see, what can I tell you about him? Well, he would put on air shows at uh, different military bases, and, uh, and he would do spins, and he talked about that in his talk today. And uh, that was kind of fun, too, because every now and then he'd get in one that didn't have to jump out. It's, it's part of the show, too, you know, <laughs> to save himself. But he's really a cultured Southern gentleman, and everybody seems to agree with that, and that's my opinion. Well, tell us about one of your adventures. Boy, I've had so many, I don't know uh, what to even think about. Uh, I was a combat fighter pilot in the Korean War, but I wasn't flying North American equipment. I was flying Republic Aviation, F-84 Thunder Jets. And I was at uh, K-2 Airport, uh, Taegu, South Korea. And that's where we operated. Uh, during uh, 1952 was when I was there, and the war was on. The Korean War was from 1950 to 53. And so while I was on that base, um, Bob Hope came to our base, too. And that was a, a great a thrill to all of us. None of us wanted to be on alert and have to be in the airplane down at the end of the runway when he was here because they wouldn't get to see the show. And then uh, after I left, uh, about three months after I left, I heard that Marilyn Monroe came to our base and got a picture of her on an F-84 Thunder jet. And uh, then they made a big poster out of it and people sold it all around the world. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Betty. Thank you for joining Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.